Like that is the confidence that my guys have. And it happens because I, I just teach these guys a certain way of living, man. Like we just try to make, I try to make, I'm trying to make a lot of millionaires, man. That's like, that's my goal. What is up, everyone? I'm Jonathan Bannister, your host of Home Service Hustle, and we've got Victor Rancor on the show today. Guys, he's a serial entrepreneur, some loving, some hating. He's going to tell his story how 10 years ago he was making $6 an hour changing oil in people's cars in Cleveland, Ohio, and how a few years from now, by the age of 40, he will be a billionaire. Guys, you don't want to miss this show. Let's go. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Home Service Hustle. I'm your host, Jonathan Bannister. And today we have the man, the myth, the legend, Victor Rancor. Victor, thank you for joining. And let me like put the word finally in quotation marks there. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I, you know, I've been wanting to get on, man. I know it's the time. It hasn't worked out, but I'm glad we finally, finally got the time. I'm, I'm sorry for missing a couple meetings there. Maybe hey, that's five, but. Hey, that's all right. You know, I get it. You're a busy dude. I think, you know, everyone understands that you've, you've got your hands mixed up into a lot of things. Um, I want to I want to get into everything that y'all are working on, what the future plans are. Obviously, we want to talk about the big event that's coming up next month. Um, I want to talk about like where it all started for you. And, and I know you've told the story a lot, but it, it's a story that I think a lot of people should understand and hear. So tell us about the Victor story, uh, how you got into this space and, you know, what was it the plan all along? No, man. So, you know, just like anybody else, I mean, I was, I was 20 years old and I was lost, had no idea kind of what direction I was going to go. Uh, this is about, you know, 2014, my, my, you know, I just moved back to California about two years before that. I've been working at that point. I've been working every odd job you could think of from bus and tables, serving tables, construction, phone sales, uh, a lot of stuff. So, I mean, I kind of, you know, obviously I got to go through my, my education, right. My life education over those couple of years and, and learning kind of what I'm good at, what I like to do and stuff like that. And, uh, 2014, well, I guess technically 2013, you know, my, my fiance at that time got pregnant and, you know, we ended up having our daughter in 2014. And at that point, you know, I was doing construction. I was doing, um, I was I made, doing like masonry work. So I was doing, we were building like outdoor fireplaces and I mean, we were doing like all kinds, a lot of stone work, stuff like that. So like really high end finished stuff that we were doing and working okay. on. Uh, and I was working for my, uh, you know, my fiance at that time, I was working for her father, her father-in-law as a general, he was a general contractor and he was training me to become a general contractor. Like I thought that was kind of the direction I was going. I was working, I was, you know, we got paid by the day. I was getting paid cash. It wasn't like a crazy amount of money, but it wasn't a little bit of money either. So like I was still making ends meet. Uh, but at that point I'm living in a, living in a room in a house. So me and my buddies, you know, got this, we had this party place, right. And then, you know, me and my chick are together living in a room in that house and every day is a party going on. So like, you know, they're always coming home at two in the morning and, you know, I remember coming out and guys are fighting in my front yard and all kinds of shit all the time. And I'm just like, I'm just trying to, you know, at this point I'm already starting to evolve and become a man and, and, and not be being a dumbass, you know what I mean? And so my daughter was born 2005 or 2014 in, in uh, September. So she's about to be eight years old next in a couple of weeks here. And, uh, daughter was born and I'm like, dude, I got to figure out something better. And, you know, at that point when she was born, I started, you know, I started really working harder at the general, at the general contracting stuff. I was going, I was starting to study for my test, starting to figure out what it was going to take to be able to start my own business. Um, a couple months goes by, uh, and we're doing, we're doing some contracting work. I called a buddy of mine that I went to high school with and cause he was looking for work. I said, Hey man, can you come over and help us for the day? We needed someone to fucking you know, push the wheelbarrow around, right? Carry stones in the backyard, carry concrete mix. And he came work for us for a couple of days. And he's like, I'm like, Oh wait, we'd like to have you back. Like we need, we need kind of need someone full time. And he's like, well, I'd love to. He's like, I got this opportunity. I'm going to go interview at this company. I found him on Craigslist. So, you know, that sounded sketchy already. Uh, found him on Craigslist and he's like, I'm going to go apply for him. They're going to, they're going to pay me, you know, 70 grand a year. They're going to give me a work truck. They're going to train me how to do HVAC. And I didn't know what the fuck HVAC stood for or what it, what it was at all. So I, I told him, I was like, all right, whatever, dude, I'll just let me know next week when you need work. Cause I already knew, like, I've just figured it wasn't going to work out, you know, sounded, sounded, sounded great, but just, I didn't think it was going to happen. Uh, didn't see him again for a while, you know, didn't talk to him for a while. And I invited him over to my Super Bowl party in, uh, February, 2015. 
uh, it was a Seahawks game, Seahawks and Patriots when uh, Russell Wilson decided to throw the ball in the fucking end zone at the last play. So I, lost I, I, don't, money. I don't think he decided to throw it. I think he was ordered to make that he, stupid ass pass. He made a dumbass decision and lost me some cash. So I wasn't too happy about that. So son of a bitch. Anyway, so beyond that, so I, at the Super Bowl party, I started talking to the buddy. I haven't seen him in a while. And, and I was like, oh, how's that job going? He's like, dude, it's going great. Like he got, he got out of training. And at this point, he's making a lot of money. Like he, he, he had his pay stub and he showed me his paycheck. And I literally said, I'm like, if you can make that much money, I need a fucking interview tomorrow. Cause I'm like, this guy fucking sucks. <laughs> and I, and he probably listened to this and he always gets mad when I tell the story and you know, he's doing well for himself. He's got his own business now and stuff. So, it, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about that. The, the tree of people that came from that organization and, and how it changed all of Southern California's whole like eco ecosystem of, of companies. So it, it's actually a cool story to even really think about the branch that Leland Smith had created out here. Um, but anyway, so, you know, I went and applied and when I applied, they, they, the cool thing about service champions, and I don't know if you know much about them, but they're they're one of the big, biggest companies. And the cool thing about them is they put you through a ringer to get a job. They, they don't just like, if you walk in the streets, say I want a job. They're like, ha ha, how about three more interviews? And we'll think about it. And we've got to deal through all these fucking tests and all this shit. Because they want to make you feel like you won the lotto getting a job with them. And, and I, yeah. I do this. I do the same thing now with my organization. And I didn't think about it then why they did it. But they wanted to weed out the people that didn't weren't really going to be there. So, but I go to this interview and I talk to this guy and he's just like, you know, it's, it's a guy named Lawrence Castillo. I don't know if you've ever interviewed him, but he'd be a great interview to have on okay. too. Uh, Lawrence is a great guy. They're interviewing me. They're like, well, we want to, you know, we like you. I think we'd be, you'd be a good installer. And I was like, you fucking must have read wrong what I applied for, brother. I didn't apply to be a fucking installer. I applied to be a technician. And he's like, well, you know, I think you're good with your hands. You got contracting background. We, we'd like to really put you into the install department. I'm like, you're not understanding. Like, I don't want the job as an install. I'm not doing it. I'm like, I want to do what my buddy's doing. I saw his paycheck and I'm telling you right now, give me an opportunity and I will beat him. Like, not even close. And the guy's like, well, you're confident. And I was like, no, like, you're not understanding what I'm <laughs> telling you here, dude. And, and I'm like, that's not the job I want. So I want this job. Otherwise, you know, it's okay. I could just leave. And, you know, he's like, all right. He's like, well, don't leave. Let me go talk to these other guys. I talked to the other managers. Like, all right, cool. Well, we'll let you know. We're going to call we're call people back for second interviews. We'll let you know if you if we're going to give you a shot. So um, I left there thinking I'm fucking not going to get a phone call probably because I, I wasn't too happy about them making me want to be an installer. So uh, I left a couple of days goes by and I, I finally get a phone call. And it's, you know, from a from a number in that area code. So I answered it. And they're like, hey, we want to bring you back for a second interview. They put me through a fucking panel interview. So this third interview, I got Leland Smith and I got all of his top executives. All these, and I'm sitting in a chair like I'm sitting in now in front of all these people. And I'm like nervous as all hell. Um, but, you know, went through that and they asked all their questions and they like asked me like really weird questions to kind of see how I'd react. Like, you know, they really tested me. So which it's a good thing, too. Like if you're listening to this, you got an HVAC business, man. Like if you want to start getting the best guys you got to weed them out in that in that interview process because that's how you're going to ensure you're going to invest in the right guys uh so they went through this this panel interview and and finally they said okay well we'll let you know we got a third interview coming i'm like what the fuck dude just give me the damn job already you know what i mean like i felt like i did really good on that interview finally they ended up getting me the job and that was in uh march 3rd 2015 is when i started in hvac and you know i still remember the day and it was the day my life kind of changed um they put me through some training. We had like six to eight weeks of training or something like that. And I did not do very good. Like I, I got bad ADD and just like, I you know, barely sit still now. Imagine me sitting through fucking eight hours of boring ass class. Uh, that's, you know, that's why I struggled in school. Um, uh, mostly cause I can't focus. And, and I always tell people a story. So like my, my junior year in high school, I'm sitting in a, uh, uh, political science class or some shit. And I'm failing that class, dude. I'm not even, dude, I only care. I only went to school so I can play football. And as I'm sitting in this class and this girl comes up to me and she sees my grade on the thing. And she's like, wow, you're kind of fucking dumb, aren't you? And I was like, <laughs> I was like, what'd you say? And she's like, you're kind of dumb. I was like, no, you don't understand. I just don't give a fuck. And so I remember it motivated me. And that day I said, okay, well, let's see what I can do. So that and all of a sudden I went home that night. I'm like, I'm going to fucking pass this class. And I ended up getting, ended up, getting that that semester i ended up being on the dean's list ended up being the highest highest grades in the whole fucking in the whole uh, junior class in that semester because she pissed me off and i said look right. and then I, I still remember i said i ain't fucking dumb i just don't this shit's boring right 
and that that was my conversation with her. So the same thing happened with this HVAC stuff. So I'm going through these trainings and they're going through all the fucking processes and procedures. And I'm just like drowning out. I'm like, dude, just get me out in the field, man. So the, the manager, Lord saw that and he knew that I was just struggling. I was struggling to stay, I stay awake, let alone want to be there. Cause I got a five at this point, I got like a five or six month old baby. I'm up all night and then I'm showing up at work at seven in the morning, just tired, you know? Yeah. And then I got to sit through these classes. So he's like, he's like, Hey, Vic pulls me aside. He's like, you're struggling, dude. I was like, yeah, I am struggling. I was like, I just get me in the damn field, man. Like I don't learn in a classroom. That's not how I learn. And he's like, right, I'm just going to put you out in the field. And he started to just push me into ride alongs right away. And, and that, that was the best thing he could have done. Cause I think I was, I was getting to the point where I was like, I'm just going to walk out of this place dude, cause I'm, I'm not interested in sitting through these classes all day long for another five weeks or four weeks or whatever it was. Put me in the field and the second I got in the field, I started making people money. Like that was that I I just I enjoy sales and it's been part of my whole family, my whole life. My, my mom was in sales, all my uncles, my all my family's in sales. And once I and I was the I'm the only one in my family that's good with my hands and can sell. So I think that's what made it like lethal for me as a technician because I was I was very good with my hands. I could fix or repair anything. Like right away I picked it up really easy. And then I was very good at communication. Right. So I would do it. I would just start listening to the best guys over and over, listening to the best guys, figuring out, okay, what are they saying? How are they saying it? Okay, what's the nuances they're saying it? What's the reason? Why do they say it at this point? Why do they say this at this point? And I really started thinking the science behind about behind the sales process and why they ask certain questions. And I still remember I'm doing ride-alongs. And this is the day I knew I'm like, okay, I'm I'm gonna be good at this job. So I'm with one of the I'm with one of their top technicians, or whatever, and I'm doing a ride along. We get done with the call and we went through all this shit. And I, I had him do extra stuff. I'm like, hey, did you check this coil? Did you do this? And we get to the truck and we're getting ready to, you know, close out or go over there. I'm like, hey, you didn't offer that customer anything. And he's like, What were you gonna offer him? I was like, I was gonna offer him this air purifier, or this, this, and this. And he's like, Well, why don't you go in there and do it then? I said, okay. Mm -hmm. So the fucking guy sits in the truck. I write up all the notes and I go in there and I'm in there for probably 30 minutes. And I come out and I had sold it. I sold it for like 2,800 bucks. And he starts yelling at me. I already told them I'm done with this call. I'm on to the next one. I'm like, dude, I, you get paid how much to install this shit? I was like, how about you shut the fuck up? I'll take the money. You get the fuck out of here. I'll go install it myself right now. And he was like, what? I'm like, yeah, I just made you, you know, I think he made 20% of the job. So I made you fucking five, $600 right now. And you're yelling at me. And that's what I knew. I was like, this is my competition. These guys are fucked. They, they don't want to work hard, man. Mm -hmm. And and so day one, I, I literally, I said, I want to be the top technician in the company. Month one, never doing HVAC in my life. They gave me a truck. I ended up being the number one number one technician in the company. Uh, the whole company, there's like 60 or 70 technicians at that point. Um, smashed everybody. And that that's kind of, I just knew, I just, every single day I went home and I grinded. Every single day I went home and I studied. I'd study on my dog. I'd study on my daughter. I'd practice on my wife. I would think all I did was submerse, submerse myself in HVAC sales and how to become the best at that. And and I did. I became Airtime 500, number one in the country, very, very fast. Very first month I won as the top turnover tech in the country. Uh, by within like six months, I had broken all their records going in. Uh, I had broken all the company records as a technician. And I kept getting promoted, and finally they allowed me to start doing sales, uh, HVAC sales. So service champions, same thing. Like most companies, like if a guy's decent at sales, are just like here, go sell shit. Right. They don't. They don't do that. They put you through like to become a sales guy at service champions. You have to be the best of the best of the best. Like the guys that I was in the room with are fucking dogs. Like those guys are selling a million dollars a month in Southern California with no weather. Okay, these guys are dogs. This ain't Vegas where it's fucking shooting fish in a barrel. This ain't where it's hot and humid. This is 75 degrees running tune-ups and selling a million bucks in a month. Okay, these are dogs. And this is why I said you come you come take any of my technicians that are sales guys that I was that I worked with, you put them anywhere in the country, they will beat anybody's ass every day, 7 days a week, like not even close. And the reason was we just we literally role played and practiced every day and that room was just like we wanted to fuck each other up. Like that was our mentality. Like we want to fuck you up. You ain't going to beat us. And we would practice all day and I would sit with these guys and you know, these guys are making, we're selling a, a regular system, like a, maybe a 16 year system with ducks for fucking $35,000, $36,000. This is six years ago, five years ago. Right. Right. So we weren't, and this is change outs. This ain't cut ins and bullshit. This is changing out ducks in the system. One day job. We're selling them for $36,000. And so you've got to be very good communicators. You got to be very good at sales. And, and that's what we became really good at. And that's, you know, obviously it's a blessing that I got to work there and got to work with those guys. 
but I just knew like, if I can do that here, I can only imagine what I can, you know, do for myself or whatever. Yeah. So I last yeah, sort of I, I, I'm still trying to figure out like how the fuck you got the job. Right. Because I picture you in that panel interview you talk about. And all I see is uh, Goodwill hunting when Ben Affleck went and, uh, you know, substituted and, and did the interview. And like, I just I'm trying to figure out like the way you are in interviews and obviously, you know, on this podcast. I like that's who you are. And I appreciate that about you, that you are who you are. But it's like, how did you get through that panel interview without just like them asking you those weird questions? You just going like the fuck you asked me that for you know uh I, you know i was i wasn't like i wasn't like that back then really <laughs> like i mean I, i'm definitely i'm definitely far more brash now like i was obviously i was nervous there i was trying to get a job but it was just i was very i've always been conf like i've been confident just because like I, you only have like who if you ain't gonna fucking believe in yourself who, who the fuck's gonna believe in you like that's yeah. how i believe like I, well, he's cocky. Well, yeah, I'm fucking cocky because I'm the fucking best. Like, I, I'm a red, what is it? Uh, when Ricky Bobby is like, I'm a fucking red blood American winning machine. <laughs> like, you have to have pure confidence all the time. Otherwise, you're never going to win. That's right. And, and when you got, when you talk to me, there isn't a fucking question if I'm going to win. It's not, it's just, it's when I'm going to win and how big. And, and once guys realize like that, it's nothing like, it's not, it's not even, it's just confidence. And if I don't, if you don't believe in yourself, you don't build big, fucking badass shit without being confident and being it being in getting like i get people to follow me like you talk to my employees they will run through a fucking wall for me because i've paved the path and i showed them how not only what you know how they, they can show them they can make money i show them how to fucking make money and i show them how to take care of themselves and i take i show them how to go buy a house i show them how to go you know how to run their life i like i i take these guys under my wing and i teach them how to do cool shit and that's the difference and and a lot of people don't tell they meet me they're like Oh, he's just this. I'm like, dude, come meet me, man. My employees will run through a fucking wall. And you, if you said something to my employee, like if you were to my employee tomorrow and I wasn't in the room and you said something to him, he hit you in the fucking mouth. Like that is the confidence that my guys have. And it happens because I, I just teach these guys a certain way of living, man. Like we just try to make, I try to make, I'm trying to make a lot of millionaires, man. That's like, that's my goal. So tell me how, uh, how much of what you do today in your business, you know, came from, the you know what you were taught like from the training from the role oh. playing i mean obviously like you you've got this amazing you know uh tech training school and stuff that you're doing and i know a lot of it was like well i'm gonna build this because i want my guys to be able to learn and go through the same training but it you know and then it's like well i've got this built let me go ahead and you know also put other people through it but like you understand that you got beat up and you had three different interviews and things like how much of that are you implemented today and, and, and with that i want to say i read one of your emails that you sent out the other day and you were talking about you know these companies that they're everybody's hurting to find staff and they want to go out and they want to throw money at people and that you want to go take them from one company and i'll give you five dollars extra an hour and that you were like you know that's setting the wrong example but if you like you were saying that um uh, that they pretty much made you feel like you work getting to come work for the best fucking company out there. And if you set that standard instead of, Hey, let me come and give you an extra few dollars to come work here. I think it's, it's setting a tone completely different. Well, they, so obviously what's what Leland Smith has built and, you know, me and him don't talk at all. He he's, he's had a grudge with me ever since I left there and, and this is what it is. Maybe one day he'll get over it. And I, I try to reach out to him every once in a while. He don't respond. So Leland, if you ever do listen to this, I doubt you will. But if you did, you should probably talk to me because like I, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for everything that he did, you know, and but just going through that business. So I got to work. You got if you guys like it's like working at one of the best you get to go work at one of the best companies in the country. You get to see how they run. You get to see how they operate. And they run like they are the most expensive company on the market, but they also have the most five star reviews. So when I started my business, I said, look, how do I do that? That's what I want to be. I don't want to be the cheap guy. I don't want to be the guy in the middle. I want to, how do I become the most expensive period, but also provide five-star service to where people don't care or don't mind paying the extra money. No. And I got, and if I never got to work at service champions, I would have never got to see that side of the business. Cause I was at service champions for about three and a half years and I left and I left there and I went to go, I got recruited. I got paid a bunch of money and, you know, same story, right? Like the guy, you know, he gave me a lot of money, he took me out to me and my family out to, he, he put us on a, a first class out to Kauai, he put us up on the North shore of Kauai for a week at a presidential suite, gave me his Range Rover to drive, like just gave me the keys. It was business to bring me over. 
And when I left Service Champions, I didn't realize I'm leaving like the friendly confines of this like beautiful organization where everything's catered to you, everything you could possibly need. And, and that's why like a lot of guys struggle when they leave there to go work somewhere else because they give you everything because they charge enough money to provide everything from the management staff to, to bonuses, to, you know, every little material that you need in the house, like everything is covered in that place. And I got to leave and go work at another organization where it was complete chaos. And I went there and I was the service manager, the sales manager, kind of the general manager helping with dispatch. And then I was out running calls for fucking 12 hours a day selling. And I was like, I was ran like a dog in that business, but it was so chaotic and such a mess. But guess what? Their prices were cheaper. And you would, you, we can sell the jobs for cheaper, but at the end of the day, what do you lose in when you sell those jobs for cheaper? You're losing all the other stuff that, that came with service champions. And so when I got to, I got to go from there and I got to see this great organization and then I got to go to see a, a big organization. It was a 20 something million dollar business, but it was ran like shit. So I got to kind of see both sides of it and pick and choose because there was some stuff that I picked up over there because I went from service champions is primarily service to replacement, right? Yeah. And they don't really, they had one estimate guy for a $50 million business. One guy ran estimates. They didn't really run any estimates. And the reason why is because obviously the higher margins on those service calls. So they, you know, at service champions, they sell memberships. So they, they have like, I think at this point they have like 32,000 monthly membership subscriptions. So at, when I left there, they're at 20 some thousand. So they got their monthly membership. So we got tune ups. We're running primarily tune ups all day. And then I went from there and I started working at a place that's a big box dealer where they're running leads where the guy went to go buy a light bulb and they're getting chased down because they went to go buy a light bulb. And next thing you know, I'm in their house an hour later to try to sell them an air conditioner. So it's two different types of clients. So most guys that leave service champions, they don't know how to adapt. And they go to these other companies and they're like, oh, shoot, these leads are way harder. This is a way harder customer to sell. This is not a customer that likes doing business with this company. Service champions, those people have been doing business with them for four or five years doing tune-ups and all of a sudden they need a new unit. It's like, hey, I'm not going to go anywhere else, you know. Uh, so a lot of – I would say 99% of the guys that left service champions went back. And obviously, so I went to this company, I started working there, and I just had to learn to adapt because I was like, I'm not going back there. They end up suing me when I left. And so I'm like, I'm not going back there, period. And when I left, I, I was like, okay, I got to figure it out. So I got to learn how to sell, how to become very good at selling uh, marketed leads. So I would sell, I would, they would give me the the Lowe's leads and I'd go in there and I'd have to figure out how to sell these things. Otherwise I didn't get to eat. So I adapted and I created my sales process that I run now for estimates, which is I've, I've helped a lot of people throughout the country learn how to sell those at a high ticket. So so I got to learn both sides of those. I got to see the ins and outs of the businesses. And then, you know, finally I had my entrepreneurial seizure and started my own business in uh, August, 2018. So, I mean, I'm sure it was like a blessing in disguise, you know, like you, 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 uh, you stumbled upon the, the first opportunity with your, your buddy, well, you know, that was picking up bricks and, you know, pushing things yeah. around, you know, that, that was your first break. But then the, going to leave in there and going to work for this other company that was a complete shit show but it obviously you you had to take a lot of nuggets from both of those opportunities and put those into your own business and say here's the, like, they got a lot of great training shit here they're putting out you know some real rock stars and over here there's a lot of dysfunction and i want to make sure that i can take the best of both of those and bring those into your own company yeah. So, I mean, the, the stuff that I took from the second company allowed me to scale my business faster, if that makes sense. So service champions, it's a slow grow. So they started in 2002 and they slowly grew as their database grew. Right. Okay. Where this other company, I learned how to take estimates and turn it and be able to grow right away. So I went to a more of a replacement model rather than a service model. So as a startup business, you can't, it's like, unless you have the capital, right? You got to have some capital to start a significant amount to start as a service model and grow it into something special, right? You got to put those club memberships in place. You got to be really good at converting tune-ups. You got to be really good at marketing those tune-ups in the beginning to be able to grow that because it takes, it takes time. You got to start, you got to get them on the membership and then it takes a little, you know, a year or two, you service their units and finally they replace it. You know, obviously you're going to get the ones that replace that day here and there, maybe about 10 to 20%. But most of them are going to be a slow play over time. You're going to start doing business with them, and eventually they're going to give you the big business. Whereas the, the replacement model, which is like what I had to do starting out or what Ishmael did, like Ishmael didn't have a service department for years. Okay, He had like two warranty techs, and that was it. It was just straight replacements because that was how he could get his money quickly, get the jobs installed and grow quickly, right? 
So there's two different two different business models. So while I'm starting my business, I'm trying to I'm doing the service model, but I'm also pulling in leads from you know face Facebook leads, Yelp leads that are replacement leads, and I'm selling those to be able to get the capital to be able to dump into the service side. Okay. So I so I learned how I, I know how to sell those estimates. I brought guys in to sell estimates. At the same time, simultaneously we're we're running some tune up ads and trying to get that the database. So it took about two years to really transition from a from a, uh, a, a estimate replacement company to now like we are, I would say 95 to 97% service to replacement. Okay. And, and that's where you're at now. You're saying, yeah, now we're, now I, I only have one estimate guy now and everything else is service replacement service selling techs or service. Uh, uh, I call them, you know, field supervisors that are going behind the technicians and selling. Okay. And obviously, I mean, that's, that's, you know, where you want it to be all along. Yeah, because you go from, you know, as a replace as a replacement company or an estimate company, the margins are thin, right? You're battling three, four or five guys every call you go to. So right. even if you're more, you're still lower than you want to be at. And when you go from a, a service, a service model where it's, you know, a tune up or repair to replacement, the margins are higher. You're putting them on the market and you're taking them off the market that day. Like yesterday, uh, you know, I was we sold like a you know 50 i sold a fifty seven thousand dollar job on a repair call they never got any other estimates they they went with us they picked the best system they picked the best best stuff because i know how to go through the entire process and, and take put them on the market and take them off the market but you know if i was a, if that was an estimate call i probably would be battling with the guy that's at 20 grand a guy that's at 30 grand and he got you know all over the place and my that price would have never been the same so i'm not able to get the gross profit that i need to be able to run a successful business can, I mean, can, how long will it take you to walk us through through that where you just said you know how to properly um, take them on and take them off of the market? Like, can you walk through what that process is of, you know, what makes what you do like that amazing that you can take, um, you know, a, let's see, a, a no cool lead that's coming in and know that you can confidently make sure that there's not another estimate that they're going to see? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I have a whole tune-up process and then that and repair call process, but I mean, I can kind of run through the gist of it. Obviously, you know, first thing is, as a business owner, your job is to provide the tools that your guys need to succeed. And if you don't provide the tools, you can't be mad that they don't succeed. Okay, okay? so provide the tools, and they and they don't succeed. That's on them. If you don't provide the tools and they don't succeed, that it, then it's on you, brother. So, as a business owner, you got to provide the right stuff. So having, you know. You know, my guys show up, they got obviously got booties, they got doormats. Uh, when they enter the house, they have, you know, beautiful little presentation books. We call them, you know, upfront pricing guides. So it talks about the company, talks about the things we do in the community, shows them our license insurance, uh, shows them past jobs, shows them pricing stuff that we do. So we have a book that the customer is going to get when they get in the house. Uh, when they get it, when we get in there, obviously, you know, a lot of, a lot of people make the mistake and, you know, everyone always thinks, oh, I'm so much better in the summertime. My numbers are better. Your numbers are actually shittier in the summertime. If you run them, uh, if you were to re truly run your numbers in the summertime compared to the slower seasons, your numbers are actually shittier. You just got more volume in the summer. So what happens in the summertime is a drunken monkey can sell an air conditioner when it's hundred degrees outside. Right. So these guys, they come in, they don't really have a process. They come in, the unit's old, and they're just telling the customer, hey, you got to replace it. And they're usually within the first 30 minutes on a repair call. You know, it's an old unit. They're like, what do you want me to do with this thing? They always go like this. What do you want me to do with this thing? It's, it's 20 years old. Where I go the opposite and my guys go the opposite. We say, hey, look, at, I'm glad you called this out. I'm the fix-it guy. I'm going to figure out what's going on with this thing, and I'm going to get you up and running today. Uh, but my only goal when I leave, before I leave here, Jonathan, is that this unit is running better than when I got here, and then and then I educate you, okay? Do you okay. mind if I take a little bit more time today, and I actually clean this thing out so that when I do get it up and running, it can actually run properly? It's going to be no extra charge to you. It's just going to take me a little extra time. The last thing I want to do, Jonathan, is come in here, fix this thing really quick, get out of here, and then things broken down on you next week. You'd be kind of mad at me, right? Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know. It's free of charge. I'm just going to get it cleaned out. I'm going to get you up and running today. But the first thing I want to do is get it cleaned out. So that when I leave here, I can give you a 90 day breakdown guarantee. Because if, if you allow me to clean it out, go through the system, you go ahead and take care of the recommendations I have, I'll give you a full 90 days. If it breaks down, you don't pay another penny. Okay. Perfect. Now I just got the green light to go through the entire system, right? Where most guys, they, they go like this, they put their blinders on, they see a broken unit, they go right to the fucking capacitor and then they go fix the capacitor and they're in and out of there in 30 minutes. And we're the opposite. We're like, oh, guess what? That capacitor is going to be broken an hour from now. 
It's not mm-hmm. going to fix its fuck itself. I don't care about that capacitor. I want to check the rest of the entire system out. I want to open up the coils. I want to check amp draws. I want to check blower motors. I want to check the ductwork, all this other stuff. So I can be like, hey, Jonathan, you got a bad capacitor, right? This this part's going bad. But the reason this part's going bad is because of X, Y, and Z. And we got all these other issues going on. So you know, I won't be able to give you that 90-day breakdown guarantee. I have no problem taking care of that for you today and getting, this, getting it up and running. But keep in mind, this is just a Band-Aid to what everything else is going on. And this is it's a symptom rather than, than, the, than the cause of the problem. Okay. And by the time I go through everything, I showed them up a clogged up coil. I showed them a dirty blower motor. I showed them the leaky oil out of their fan motor. I showed them the amp draws on the compressor. I showed them how dirty the coils are. All this other stuff. I showed them their duct work. I showed them why the airflow in their house is dog shit. And they've never, no one else has bothered to explain to them why the airflow in their, in their daughter's room sucks. I went through all this stuff. By the time I get done with it, they're like, okay, well, what's a new one, right? Like, what's it, what's it going to cost? And rather than most guys are in and out there in 30 minutes, I'm already, I'm two hours into this thing. I've already put my sweat equity into it. I've already put the time into it. I broke this thing down. I've explained everything. I left no question on turn. So that customer knows I'm a professional, right? And that's how we're able to get these people to, because people don't care about how much you know until they care and they know how much you care. Right. Yeah. So we get these people to understand like, Hey, this, there's a whole system. These are all the things going on. And if you don't take care of it now, it's just kicking the bucket, kicking it down the, down the road. And I'll usually say, Hey, look, you know, I'm the, I'm the fix it guy, Jonathan. I don't mind getting this thing fixed. Right. But keep in mind, this is this X, Y, and Z the cost. I do a true cost of ownership thing going over with them. By the time I'm done, they're just like, well, how much is the new one? And I make sure that I say, I don't know how much a new one is. I'm just the fix it guy. Okay. I don't just go, a lot of guys will get all excited and pop a fucking wheelie because someone asked them how much a new one is. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. They got to ask me like three or four times before I'll even think about giving them fucking pricing. I'll ask them well, how much, a new, well, I, why do you want to get a new one, Jonathan? What makes you want to get one? Uh, I mean, like, you, you just named like a hundred issues that I'm having. So it just sounds like it would be cheaper if I was getting a new one. I mean, it's not going to be cheaper, but in the long run, yes, the, the true cost of ownership of this thing is going to be a lot less. And Jonathan, you know, I'm just the fix it guy. Is this something like, obviously right now it's middle of summer. We're booked out a couple of weeks on the sales guys to get out here because everybody's trying to take advantage of some of these rebates we have going on. Is this something like, hey, if I get someone out here, you're trying to get this done right away? Or is it something you're just kind of kicking the tires on? I mean, and if that, the price is right, I want to get it done now. Perfect. That's what I want to hear, right? So I'm going to hear that and I'm going to say, okay, the price is right. Well, let me see what I can do, Jonathan. I can't make any promises. I can't, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call my manager, see if I can pull any strings, right? And I'll call my manager in front of them and, you know, I'll say, hey, hey, Brad, it's Victor. You know, I came out here on a diagnostic. We thought the unit was only, it was eight years old. It ended up being 15 years old. Uh, when I got here, Jonathan said this thing's never been serviced. We went through the entire system. You know, I found a bad capacitor. But there's a multitude of other things going on. I found a leaky, the fan motor's leaking oil, the, the primary motor controls burnt pitted. I got high starting amps. I checked the indoor unit. That was even worse. Looked like Chewbacca's living in the blower wheel. Coils clogged up. I checked the duct work out. Jonathan told me that his daughter's room and his son's room get terrible airflow. When I went up in the attic, I found that the ducts were, you know, not sealed, that there's no dampers on the connection. So I wasn't able to adjust it for him. But I went through everything. I gave Jonathan his repair options and he wants to know what it'd be like to be to what it cost to replace it. Yeah, I know the sales department's really booked up. Oh, is that possible? Hey, Jonathan, it's, it's something you're trying to get done right away. And the only reason I ask is my manager says that if it's something you're trying to get done, uh, he can push my calls back. I got like four calls behind me. He can push them back for me today. And he can say, he said if I can send him over some membership or send him over some measurements, he can send me over some pricing, right? Jonathan's going to say, oh, wow, that'd be awesome. Yeah, the cool thing is I can cut out all the sales guys' commissions. Would you rather do it with me or the sales guy? Hmm. And you say, well, you, okay, cool. Hey, yeah, Brad, you know, Jonathan says, you know, if he can push my schedule back, he really wants to get this done. Uh, when you send over the pricing though, I'm going to send you over the measurements. We send over the pricing. Can you send me over the friends and family deal? I want to go ahead and take care of this guy. He's been, so he's been super awesome. Boom. Get off the fucking phone, do all my measurements, send it over to them. And then by the time I go over to my presentation at the table, they're like, well, can you save us any money? Hey brother, I already gave, I told you, you heard me on the phone. I had him send me the friends and family pricing. I can't go any lower than this. If, is it, is there any reason why you can't move forward with this? And they're like, Oh, it's a little bit high. Well, let me make a phone call. I can't promise anything. If, if I call my boss and, and he says, you know, maybe I, you could scratch our back. We'll scratch your back. If I have like an install spot tomorrow or something like that, was that something you'd be willing to take? If, if I can get you a little bit lower on this and he could call, Hey, look at they 
Jonathan wants to get this taken care of. He asked if there's any way we can maybe get some kind of install on setup. He wants to move forward with it. He really wants a three star package. He really wants this. And then boom, now we're now we give him like 500 bucks off. We take our next install spot. We sell it on the spot rather than having to wait for another guy to come out. When do you like to talk about the the financing perspective as your your you know because you're you're the you're the fix it guy but if he's agreeing for you to be there so and, so normal uh, so so normally I'll say hey look and when I'm on the when I'm doing the role play hey Jonathan how did you plan on paying for this we have a bunch of no money down options is that something you'd be interested in we have stuff that's low interest and we have stuff that's low payment uh, which one would be more interesting to you uh, the the lower payment. Hey, yeah, Brad, can you, when you send that over, can you send me over the financing options too? He's looking at, into a more of a low payment option. Can you please also send me the no interest option just in case that's something he's looking to do? Cool. And I'll do it like that. So when I go and they're like, hey, they sent me over, these are the options they sent over and they have the, the financing already set up there. And, and listen, I, I'm, I'm super excited that I, that I asked you to kind of go through this process because I was reading, a, I think it was a post that you made the other day. It was talking about, uh, it was, was it the capacitor I think that you replaced or somebody else? And then you put your pricing on there and then you had a couple of people throw, throw some jabs at you. Right. And it's like hearing you walk through your process, they agreed for you to inspect the whole system. You've got two or three hours sweat equity in it. Like you just said. And now like, I think it's fair that they say, you know what? I just want to go ahead and, you know, throw the bandaid option on there. Like it, it's justifiable that you're going to charge the pricing that you do. No. And, and that's, I mean, that's the key is like a lot of people don't realize, like they think I'm just going in there in 10 minutes and changing the capacitor. Yeah. Well, that would that's be, what they're doing. Right. That's what so. they're doing. And they don't understand. And, and they also like, if they came to my training and the people that have, they're like, Oh fuck. And then I'm not lying to the people. All I'm doing is giving them options and I'm building it to where they understand what's going on because most people, they just don't understand all the things that go into a system. They just think broken fix, broken <laughs> fix. Right. But all of a sudden they're like, Oh shit. That's why I've had allergies for the last fucking 10 years. That's why little Timmy's room airflow sucks. That's why the damn thing's so loud. That's why my energy bills are so fucking high. Well, if you didn't take your time and educate them, they just think it's freaking normal and they move on with it because right. the, most of the time when you get in the house, the customer's not going to tell you the things that are wrong. You have to uncover it. And guess what? When you uncover it without them telling you what happens then? They think they fucking trust you. They think you're well, a god. Absolutely, you're, they think you're, you're the how, an expert. You've never been in my house, and I like to say it all the time because I'll go, I'll go look at the ductwork. If I go on a broken call, even on an estimate, whatever, I like to go in the attic or because in California we have attic, we have our access to the ductwork. I know not everywhere does, but I'll go up there and I'll say, hey, hey, Jonathan, I've never lived in this house in the summertime, but I bet you these two rooms suck. And he's like, yeah, they do suck. How did you know? I said, based on what I saw up in the attic, there's no way you can get any airflow in those rooms. Right then and there, that customer fucking trusts me and he's done. Yeah, that's right. And there's no way for, for you to be able to give that information out unless you go through the level of inspection that you have. Yeah, if, you, if you're just in there in and out in a couple of minutes, it's not possible. So like well, we I I fully deserve because I do know like we we my guys, my technicians do a badass job every call. We have our checks and balances in place to make sure that they do. Uh, my, I know that my installation team, there's not a better installation team in California. We put in day in and day out. You see me posting our installs Our every install is perfect. Like we, I got OCD when how, how, how shit needs to be done. So my install, I know my service team is doing a badass job. I know my install, my install team is doing a badass job. I know my office got their shit down. I know that when you call my office right now, they're going to ask you how they can make you smile today. I know if you got a problem, anything happens, we've got a warranty tech that's going to be out there within probably within 12 hours, probably within 24 for sure. But within 12 hours, more than likely, you're going to have a guy at your house to come fix your unit if you call with an issue. So when people say you charge too much, I say, I don't fucking charge enough because the stuff that we provide, you don't provide and you don't deserve to charge the price that we, char we charge. Well, and, and, and so, and I know, you know, you're, you're speaking to some of those people and I was going to ask you like, you know, what are your thoughts when, when they make comments like, well, you know, you, you, what is it? Well, how much were you charging for the capacitor replacement? It's like 900 bucks, 995 or something like that. Yeah. And they were like, you know, I don't know how morally you do that. And it's like, well, how would you even handle a call that comes in and the person tells your CSR, um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking, uh, my capacitor's out. I need it fixed. Like, how, how do y'all even handle that? Because you obviously well, know that they've already mm -hmm. talked to someone that said that's, and they're just looking for the lowest price they can. To we schedule, it. we get, we schedule like a regular call, but usually that person and we, cause we charge a diagnostic fee. We say it's 99 bucks to come out. That guy's going to be like 99 bucks to come out. I just need a capacitor. Well, I'm sorry, sir. That's what it costs us to come out. And that call will usually scrub it at the door. Okay. 
So a lot of guys make the mistake is they don't they don't charge a, a service call fee, right? I'm gonna come out. And we we get so excited because most people don't know how to decide who their customer who the, who the customer is and isn't, right? Like we scrub the shit out. I get so many calls that I, I my competitors should be fucking happy. I feed them calls all day long. I got a list of competitors I send calls to, depending on what it is. And the reason I do that is because they're, they're, those aren't my customers, and I know that they service those type of customers. I have a specific out or uh, what's they call the avatar of a customer that I want. Yeah. Okay. And if you don't fit my avatar, I don't want you. I would rather someone ask me. They're like, I I have eighteen revenue producing technicians. Okay, eighteen, and we did two point six seven million dollars last month with eighteen fucking revenue producers that's technicians and sales guys i think i only have six sales guys and the 12 technicians and we did 2.7 million dollars installed last month okay find me another company on the planet that did that you won't period because we run we only we go to the customers that we like we go to the customers that we want to do business with and we go to the customers that are going to pay us what we deserve and then we also follow the damn process every time what what do you say to those guys that you know say like Victor? I don't know how you sleep at night. You're, you're that that's entirely too much money to be charging for that. I mean, I the first thing that comes to my mind is, um, you like how do you how can you know your numbers? How can you say you know your numbers at all if you're charging a hundred and fifty dollars to replace a capacitor because it only costs you twelve bucks? But I mean, how how are they properly factoring in their they're their not. vehicle? They're fuel? not. The technician, their fucking insurance, everything well, else. My, like you are losing money when you leave that home and charge 150 or 200 dollars for that capacitor. The lead costs more than that. So by the time Absolutely you book the lead, it costs more than that. So and, and you gotta also think about I'm in Southern California, right? So we have traffic. I can only run so many calls per day. Uh then I have obviously gas is, is more expensive than anywhere else in the country. Workers comp is more expensive than anywhere else in the country. Taxes are more expensive, right? And then I also have cost of living. How much of the cost of living in Southern California? It's expensive, right? So I got to, I got to pay my employees a livable wage to be able to survive in Southern California. On top of that, I got to be able to make a profit on top of that. I got to make enough money to be in business in, in a couple of years from now, if anything does go wrong. Also, I provide some of the best benefits in the country. So I got, I got full medical and dental benefits for all my employees, paid vacation, uh, 401k. We have, uh, fucking all kinds of shit. We do all kinds of give backs for our employees. We play them well. I mean, I got technicians all making $150,000 plus a year. Some guys making a half a million dollars a year. So it's like, dude, it, how could you sleep at night not fucking taking care of your employees the right way? My employees are buying houses, buying cars, buying second properties. What are your employees doing? Right. They're fucking probably starving, probably wishing they can come work for me. If they could, they live close enough, they'd work for me. <sighs> because that's 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 what I provide. I provide a place where these guys can grow and take care of their family and, and be able to give back to my community and do stuff like that. People think like I'm just living like a like a like a crazy person. I invest everything back in my business. Okay. I pay myself probably less than most of you guys pay yourself out of your business. I, personally, I don't need the money, but because I do other things. But like for me, I just reinvest everything in my employees. I reinvest in training. I reinvest in growth. And in the long run, we're gonna have a business that no one is gonna be able to touch. Like I guarantee you, over the next five years, people are gonna realize that I am one of the best operators in the entire country and not even fucking close. It's not even so close. What 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 will Absolute airflow do this year in revenue? Uh, we should finish about 23 million out of the one location. What are the goals for next year? Uh, I, my goal is 50 million next year. Really? Mm -hmm. So over 100% growth next year. Mm -hmm. All right. What, what's the what's the game plan look like? What, what does that blueprint look like that you're going to double so the I just, So I just acquired a company in Santa Clarita. They're doing $3 million in plumbing. Uh, not charging enough. They got a great customer base. So um, that branch, I believe next year is going to be $15 million just by, the, by adding AC to it. Every $3 million of plumbing is $9 million in HVAC uh, work. So even if I don't up the plumbing, we're going to end up around $12 million, which I think we're going to up that plumbing too. Just I've only at bottom three weeks ago, we've already broke their all-time company sales record for a month. Um, so I already know that that company is going to be doing great. So I'm adding that on. Um, over here, we got our training facility in Southern California. I'm going to be hiring about 40 technicians over the next probably three months, putting them through training. I think about 15 of them will make it through the training. Uh, once those trust host technicians come out, the average technician is going to do about a million, a million and a half a, a year. So you do the math on that, adding those on top of that, plus my Santa Clarita branch. Uh, if I can get the trucks, God willing, everything else works out, then it should be 50 million. It should be easy for us. I love it. All right. Let's talk about, um, let's talk about what, what all, what all does Victor have going on? right now and what are some of the future plans that we may not know about 
Um, you know, right now, obviously, I, I got my, my AC business here in California. Uh, me and Bill Pulte um, have partnered in about, I want to say, 14 other locations now in 10 different states. Uh, so we're looking for other uh, other hungry entrepreneurs that want to grow their business and make more money. So, you know, we, we do our partnerships differently than everybody else. Everybody else wants to have majority ownership. We take a minority backseat. We inject some capital. We give you our blueprint to success on how we run our business. How do we run calls? How do we do all this stuff? How do we do our uh, put our financials in place? We bring in our, you know, obviously our buying power. So we're able to lower cost on that. Uh, most of our, I would say almost every single one of our partners has doubled or tripled revenue and profits in the last 12 months. Um, so we have that going on. So I think over the next, my goal is me and Bill have a, a our, our scary, big audacious goal, right? Our bag, our, you know, is, B-hag. Is, yeah. B-hag, whatever the hell it was, uh, is to have 50 additional 50 companies by next year um, in our in our portfolio. So if you're looking for, do you guys what is that sweet spot you're looking for? We're looking for that company. It's it's anything, man. But I mean, obviously, you want a company that wants to grow. So you give me you give me an operator that says, you know, maybe he's he's doing a couple million dollars a year, two three million dollars a year. He's young, he's hungry, and he just doesn't know how to get from from A to Z. You know what I mean? And, and we'll teach him. Um, you know, but we we're not against taking on a forty million dollar any company that wants to partner with us. We will make them more money. Uh, we'll take we'll get them help them get to the exit. Like you know, Bill's Bill's now exited six. Uh, six companies in the last uh, like six years for over $70 million each. And he partnered with them at like $2 million companies. Oh. So he's got, well, he's got one in Semper Fi in Arizona. He partnered with him at $3 million uh, 18 months ago. Uh, that company valuation right now is at $70 million. Wow. Okay. So we, the stuff that we do is not like the other guys. Bill's exited plenty of jobs. I know how to put processes in place in the operation side. We know how to put the financial controls in place. We know how to, we know how the light, the blood pulse of a business and how to grow them. And we just do things differently. So if you're, uh, I think over the next couple of years, we're, we're going to grow a billion dollar platform probably faster than everybody else because we're going to do it to where the owners keep to keep majority. So we want the owner to have majority of it because we have a belief that when you take that owner out of that business and he doesn't have that majority anymore, he's just never going to work as hard. He's the pulse of that business. Yeah. So I would rather you, we keep the heart in there, right? And we, we're just, we're just the artery for pumping the blood, for helping pump the blood for that, for that owner. And, and he gets to keep all the glory. He gets to keep his business. He gets to tell, he gets to tell us what to do realistically. He doesn't have to do anything. We tell him what to do. If he wants to go do whatever the fuck he wants, as long as he ain't stealing money, we're good. You know, it's just yeah. one of those things. And a lot of times it takes a little bit of time to get these guys to follow our process because you're like, we can't force them to do it, but we'll just like, Hey, dude, if you would have done this, when I told you, we'd already have this, you'd have this. And you know, we got guys that are now making millions of dollars a year. We got, you know, one in Georgia, we partnered with in, uh, I want to say July, end of July last year, they were doing $3 million a year with or like three and a half million dollars a year with nothing to the bottom, $0 to the bottom. They're going to finish this year at about 12.5 to 13 million with over 30% net to the bottom. Okay. So that's the stuff that happens when people partner with us. So that's my, my goal. And then obviously we have my, my training stuff, the service rocket stuff. Uh, we are building a business blueprint. Um, so you'll be able to, it's, I'm trying to not have to be involved. Uh, so our goal is to roll out before the end of the year, our business blueprint. So where you can give it to a company that wants it like from startup to 3 million, 5 million, 10 million, whatever it is, as a blueprint, how to get to the next level. Uh, we're going to give them everything from how our, we set up our financials and all that stuff and everything that we, the whole thing, the whole playbook throughout a business. So we're going to roll that out by the end of the year. And our goal is to try to kill as many consultants as possible um, to where, you know, this, if you follow this process, you're going to make money. And then that will, that won't be any kind of equity, stake in anything that's just them buying the blueprint right yep to them just buying the blueprint and then you know obviously we hope that they want to partner with us because partnering with us has a lot of other opportunities so yeah we got that going on and then you know just going to be hanging out with my kids man i, I you know i got this event coming up in october and and after yeah, that let's talk, about it. let's talk about the yeah. event a little bit i'll be there i you know I, I somehow you got some some good sales guys that um uh, you know they know how to hit up inboxes like i hit up yours to get you on the show so I uh, got a couple VIP passes, so I'll be bringing yeah. some of my team out there. So let's talk about the event. Well, you got lucky. You got your VIP passes for cheap. Everybody else was like five grand a piece. So you got them early. I got them, but I got them you early, got, yeah. You got them early, so VIP sold out. But VIP is going to be badass, obviously. We got Joe Montana. VIP guys, we got Joe Montana uh, for a private breakfast before the event. He's going to be the first speaker uh, coming up into the event. Uh, throughout the entire thing, we're going to have some of the best owners, operators, motivators, trainers in the country, just teaching, teaching people. And, and I like to do things a little bit different. Uh, most, most fucking, most 
conferences you go to are like big pitch fest. My conversation to everybody on stage is I'm not pitching shit. Okay. We're kind of, we're trying to bring, we're trying to bring knowledge. We're trying to bring stuff that's going to be able to impact us, people's lives. Right. So uh, the reason I did the event on a Friday, Saturday, is so there was a shorter period of time between when you went back, back home and when you went to work, uh, because we want you to be able to implement that shit right away. Cause what happens yeah. if you have a conference on a Tuesday or Wednesday, you end up taking the rest of that week off. And then by the time you get back to Monday, you already have forgot about everything. So I specifically make my, my, my conference is always the same day, Friday and Saturday. Um, and you know, then, you know, I like to do things a little different too, cause obviously we're a younger generation and, and, you know, we want to play, but we, we want to work, but we also want to play. So I'm, I'm throwing some badass after part, uh, badass after parties. I got, uh, the first night we got a, a black tie event with, uh, we got orchestra band. I got a Frank Sinatra cover band playing. we got cigar rollers. We have dancers. We rented out a whole nightclub. Uh, so that venue is pretty badass. And then the last night we got a Halloween party. I got run DMC is going to be DJ. You can rent out private cabanas. Uh, so you have cabanas to hang out in. We got food, dancers, all kinds of shit going on with that night. And you'll be able to talk and meet with all the speakers. They're all going to be, you know, a lot of the speakers are going to be at the after parties uh, from, you know, Ed Milet, Joe, uh, Ryan, or Ryan Stuman, Brad Lee. Um, Montana's obviously going to be leaving early. He's a little old. But uh, yeah. You're going to have some, some badass uh, heavy uh, mindset folks that have the same um, the language that you do, that you speak. A lot, a lot of bombs yeah. and uh you know well there, there's there's gonna be there's gonna be cussing and you know I, i'm gonna i try to tone it down on the stage so you know i'm from I'm, you know i talked to wyatt hempworth a lot wyatt hempworth he's got a yeah. hour of services and you know obviously they don't like cussing and stuff so i told him i said you know every time he's around i always have some respect and you know i try not to cuss as much as i can on stage uh, but I can't change who I am, man. I, I didn't grow up with money. I didn't grow up with nothing, no spoon, golden spoon in my mouth. I'm I'm just a fucking regular kid. I was, you know, I worked, you know, I was, like I tell everybody, I was 10 years ago, I was doing oil changes for $6 an hour living in Cleveland, Ohio. So, you know, I never, I didn't, I never expected in my life to be, you know, a 33 year old multimillionaire running all these organizations and doing all this shit. I, I just fell into it because I put in my, I put in a lot of freaking work day in and day out. Like it, I'm relentless. Like y'all are on vacation. I work. Like if you're around me, I'm, I don't even have a minute. You have, you had to tie me down to get on this podcast. I'm constantly doing stuff that's moving me forward. And, and that's the reason by the time I'm 40, I will be a billionaire. And it's not even a question. It's going to happen. All right. Well, we'll get to the end of the show. What advice do you, what can you give, um, you know, no matter if they're, 500,000 in revenue trying to hit their first million or they're at 10 million trying to get over a plateau. What advice do you give to a contractor right now that, you know, really just trying to get out of their own fucking way? Um, you know, reach out to people, man. And one of the biggest mistakes I made started my business is try to do it myself. You can't, you know, there's success leaves clues, right? And the whole industry, everything we do in life is R and D, right? Rob and duplicate. Figure out who the best at doing something is. Figure out what they did and then implement it, man. A lot of times the 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 trigger, like, you know, a lot of guys, their, their revolver takes too long to come, to, kick, to come back, right? So I give them information. I, I, I'm i telling you right now, I got a, I got a partner and he's he'll probably listening to this and get mad at me. But I, I, over a year ago, I tried to partner with him. We, me and Bill tried to do a deal with him. And I told him, I said, look it, I've been where you're at. I know what's going to happen to your business. By this time next year, you're going to be out of business, Okay. And he's like, well, no, he's, he started beating his chest. He's like, no, I got it. I got it. And I told him at that point, I said, your GM sucks. Okay. You need to fire your GM. He doesn't know what he's doing. Dragged it on for a year. And then finally we just, we partnered with him last month and fucking saved his life. We had a, we literally threw him a lifeline. Right. Cause I knew he was exactly where I told him he was going to be because he didn't want to go listen to the people that knew what they were doing. The people that were giving him, I was giving him free advice, like just trying to help the guy. So Get out of your own way, step up, talk to people that have been there and done it before, and then just believe in yourself. Like I told you from the beginning, man, if you if you don't have confidence in yourself, then no one's going to have confidence in you. And and just just get around good people, build some confidence, and then just don't be scared to take risks. Like I, I live by the 70-30 rule, right? 70% of the shit I do is going to be right, 30% is going to be wrong. But I always, like I think I said on another podcast, I fail so fast that people don't even notice it. Right. Cause I'm already on to the next shit. I, I can already fail and I'm already moved on because I, if you dwell on the losses and the little things, you're going to get stuck there. You just got to move on and figure out how to keep winning. R and D, Rob and duplicate. You heard it. Um, you know, Victor, I appreciate you coming on here. I know this, this was difficult for you to make because we don't shoot live. So we could have just rescheduled it. 
I know it's over 100 degrees there all day. I, I, I was not rescheduling you again. Like I, I was, that. I, I wrote that in my calendar. Do not fuck <laughs> reschedule again. Hit up. I, you know, I've been wanting to get on it, man. I, you know, I listen to the podcast. You guys, you got some good guests and stuff like that on. So, uh, I'm, I'm just been, you know, I'm blessed that, uh, that so many people invite me on to want to hear my story, man. Like I, I never in a million years thought this would be my life. So I appreciate you sharing it. I'll have you back soon and I'll see you next month in Vegas. Yep. So if you guys are interested in getting tickets, go to servicerocketnetwork.com. There's a couple general mission tickets and uh, party pass tickets left. Uh, use the promo code LFG22 uh, to get $250 off. So hope to see you guys in October. Uh, if you guys are interested, you also I have a sign up until on September 15th. I don't know if that's going to air before then, but I got I'm giving away a free trip. You get to fly out to California, hang out with me, Ishmael, Bill Pulte, Michelle, a bunch of other operators. Get on a private jet with us. I got a, I got a, a actually ended up getting two G5 jets. We're going to take those jets to Vegas. You get a VIP pass to Vegas. Hang out with me for the speaker's dinner. Hang out with me, all the VIP of the after parties. Get front row seating. So if you guys get an opportunity, make sure to enter that shit because it is a real giveaway. I've really given that shit to somebody, uh, and I hope it's you, and I hope you get to come hang out with us and see how we how we roll. And that's a, what, th a $3 million contractor and under? Three million dollar net. So okay. anybody that's that's not making less than three million dollars a year has an opportunity to get on that jet. Um, and we hope to see you guys there. And and last year I did the same thing last year. We brought some contractors on, and and those guys changed their lives for that experience. So love it, Victor. I appreciate it, dude. Wish all you right, all the best. Awesome. Thank you. All right, thanks, bro. All right.